Welcome everybody to the 10th public lecture in the Humanities Research Center's Works That Shape the World series in 2022. This year we're focusing on religion. Let me acknowledge the elders of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. These are the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people that the ANU is built upon here in Canberra. And let me welcome our special guest and our presenter today, Dr. David Tittensaw. David's a lecturer and a researcher at Western Sydney University and an honorary fellow at Deakin University. He was also a research fellow at the late great Centre for Dialogue at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And I believe that uh, I took over David's position when he moved to Deakin in, uh, in 2012. The Centre for Dialogue closed shortly afterwards, which I, ensure, I assure you is just a coincidence. Now, David is the author of, uh, most recently, Religion and Change in Australia, co-authored with Adam Possumai and published just a few months ago by Rutledge. And he's also the author of The House of Service, The Gulen Movement and Islam's Third Way, published by Oxford University Press in 2014. And it is the Gulen Movement that is the topic of David's talk today after which I'll invite you to ask David some questions using the Q&A function or the chat function, or you can use the raise hand function and I'll unmute you. So I'm very happy to hand over to David Tittensaw. Well, thank you, Ibrahim, for that um, very kind introduction. And also I must first and foremost say thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak as part of the series. Uh, as you can see, the, the uh, talk that I'm going to give today uh, is titled The Gulen Movement, Past, Present and Future. So I'll be giving sort of a, 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 an overview uh, of, of the movement, where it began, uh, where it currently is and where, where, what's likely to happen going forward. <clears throat> so to begin, I'll just provide a bit of background about the movement. And so the, the Gulen Movement is a, is, is a progressive Islamic uh, movement with traditional links to Turkish Islam. It began in 1960 in Izmir uh, by Fethullah Gulen, who was uh, a follower of Said Nursi. So it's very much associated uh, with that particular uh, uh, proto movement, which is called the, the Nur movement. So in some respects, it's called a neo Nur movement now uh, as well. Uh, and he said he was a charismatic uh, state imam and he began um, seeking to institute the ideas of Said Nursi uh, in that, that early time. And Gulen, uh, like Nursi, believed that science and religion. Uh, are mutually uh, complementary rather than opposites. And in particular, he took the view that, that like what Saeed Nursi articulated in his uh, Rizala um, you know, or Epistles of the Light, was that uh, the, the uh, more you understand the natural world through science, these are like mirrors to God. So you understand more the majesty of God, the more that you understand about the world around you. So he was very much in, in, interested in trying to bring together the natural sciences like uh, physics, chemistry, uh, maths, uh, and, and so forth, and, and bring them together with a religious sensibility. Uh, and like Sayyid Nursi, who, was, uh, who, who, who sort of straddled the, the end of the Ottoman Empire and the beginning of the New Republic, he's very critical of scientific positivism, which took place um, in the 19th century towards the end of the, the Ottoman Empire, and also militant atheism, which became part of the, the, the makeup of the New Republic as well. And so the idea for Gulen is that he's looking to try and pro pro provide a holistic education uh, through his endeavors, uh, particularly through the practice of temsil, which uh, temsil et mechmet means to uh, represent or provide an example, uh, rather than tebli, which is proselytism. And just on the idea of temsil, uh, this became a very important concept, particularly in the third stage, which I'll come to shortly of the movement, when it was looking to take its practice overseas. And so what the, what the idea of temsil means uh, is living in according to Islam wherever you are and representing it through your daily actions, but never mentioning the word Islam. And according to Gulen, those who lead the way must set a good example for their followers, just as they are imitated in their virtues and good morals, so too do their bad behaviors and proper actions and attitudes leave indelible marks upon those that, who follow them. So it's very much about, as I said, inculcating a religious sensibility and providing a good example and then providing, um, as I said, a holistic education, which is going to create rounded, religiously uh, oriented individuals who can act in the world as modern change agents. Uh, and so with regards to the movement's development, the, the community has gone through, uh, as I argue in my book, three stages. Uh, to begin with, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, this was very much the, the, the developmental part of the, the movement um, or the community building part. And this was done via summer camps. So Gulen, while still uh, uh, an imam in Izmir, 
uh, was running camps, again, bringing student, a small circle of students together where they would study uh, Cyanosis Vesala, as well as doing uh, studies of biology, chemistry, physics, and so forth. Uh, and during this period, uh, Gulen was uh, arrested following the 1971 coup and was placed in jail for seven months for anti-secular behavior. So there was still very much tension in the secular republic with these kinds of activities, uh, and Gulen was not exempt from that. In the second phase, we had the 1980s, which just witnessed a, a domestic community expansion. This was a period of opening uh, for, for the Gulen movement, and this was enabled by a privatization of the education sector and which with support from Turgut Özal, who was a surprise winner of the uh, election uh, after the three years of a military junta from the coup in 1980. Uh, and with the motherland party that won, uh, Özal had very much a religious sensibility uh, and, and was, was quite taken with, with Gulen's ideas and so was happy to provide an opening and support um, at that particular time. And so there was also a build your own schools program, which was instituted by Ozal and of course the Gulen movement, which had only just established its first uh, dormitory in 1979 would eventually by 1982 create their first school, which was Yamanla College. Uh, and that was part of that opening uh, that was starting to happen. And then of course, during that period, they were able to expand quite considerably uh, in Turkey. Again, in, in this period of expansion, uh, there was also again, uh, a tension with the state and following uh, that, um, of the coup, there was a warrant for Gulen's arrest was issued, but that was again later quashed by uh, Ozal in 1986 uh, as he supported the, the movement's expansion. They became a major player, as we'll see, uh, during that period in Turkey's education, particularly picking up the slack from where the state was actually not filling the gap in the education sector. And then we have the third stage, uh, which is in the 1990s, which is where the movement starts to expand and becomes a transnational education-based movement. And it was quite rapid expansion. And the staging ground for that was the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union with the new post-Soviet republics in Central Asia. Uh, and they, they uh, had quite a degree of success uh, building a lot of schools across there. Uh, and then of course, then moved on, uh, as we'll see into uh, as, much high, as, as many as 160 countries around the world as they began to expand as an international organization. But again, there was still uh, tension with the state during this period as well. So we'll see this is a recurring theme, an issue. Uh, and uh, a case was brought against Gulen in 1999 following a leaked video that purported to show him uh, urging his followers to sort of try and take the state from within with different, from the bureaucracy. Uh, and as a result, he, he moved or fled to the US and was charged in absentia, but again was acquitted in 2006 under the RKP or the Justice and Development Party as well. So it's, it was a somewhat tumultuous relationship, but those just as a quick overview of the three stages of development of the Gulen movement. Uh, sticking with the, the developmental uh, theme, uh, by, by the 1990s, as I mentioned before, uh, there were around uh, 150 schools uh, and 150 uh, dersanas, which are, which are effectively study centers or preparatory centers for the university entrance exams. So by, by the 90s, they'd really become one of the premier education providers in the country. Then by the mid-2000s, it was estimated uh, to be as many as 500 schools in Turkey and around 1,600 of these preparatory schools or dersanas. And more than 1,000 schools when combined with their activities in now around 160 countries around the world. Uh, and alongside their educational endeavours, they also developed publishing houses, uh, universities, newspapers, uh, uh, radio and TV stations, hospitals and dialogue foundations. So not only did they become a major education provider, they were also a major civil society actor uh, more broadly within Turkey. Uh, and as, as uh, in 2007, the movement was estimated by the State Attorney's Department to be worth uh, somewhere in the vicinity of $25 billion. Now, it was suggested by Ibor in her uh, seminal book that the movement ranged from around 8 to 10 million followers. Uh, that's probably a bit high. It was probably more in the vicinity of 2 to 3 million. Uh, some of the key organizations I mentioned they, they established during this uh, sort of um, period uh, was Zaman newspaper, which became the highest uh, circulation newspaper uh, until it was shut down. We'll come back to that shortly. Uh, Salmon Yolu TV station, there was Kainak Publishing, uh, Shifa Hospital, and on the dialogue side, they had the Journalist and Writers Foundation amongst a number of other dialogue uh, uh, organizations. They also had major business organizations such as Tuscon, uh, which was the Confederation of Business and Industrialists of Turkey. Uh, that were helping businesses associated with the movement uh, and were brokering deals around the world. For example, in 2007, uh, Tuscon helped to broker $2 billion uh, worth of contracts uh, for Gulen-inspired businesses in Africa. And indeed, it was a maxim that wherever you find the schools, 
uh, you would find associated movement businesses, which would help um, uh, provide the foundation for the running of those, uh, those endeavors. And historically, move, move, uh, movement businessmen would give money in the form of what's called himmet, a voluntary giving ranging from between 5 and 20%. Uh, and during the course of my own field research uh, in Turkey, um, back in 2007, 2008, I encountered uh, businessmen that were donating uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, every year to various movement endeavors. Uh, and on the issue of uh, numbers of members, this is a difficult one uh, to, to define because there's no formal membership process within the movement. Uh, people move in and outside of the orbit, so it's very difficult to get a fix on, on, on how many members there are. Uh, and so, as I said before, I think that the EBOR number is probably too high, and I agree with Volm, who's been critical of this, uh, saying that's probably, as I said, in, in around several million uh, for movement followers. Um, following that expansion in the 1990s, and of course, into the 2000s, they became a transnational organization. They naturally struck up uh, a, a strong working relationship with the uh, Adalet Ve Kalkanma Partisi, which is the Justin Development Party, which came to power in 2002. Uh, and although they were from different Islamist camps, the movement formed uh, what is regarded as a tacit alliance with the AKP, uh, and they, as they had uh, what is seen as consonant values, despite again coming from different Islamist camps, one being largely apolitical, and obviously the other one coming from the Miligurish side, the National View side, uh, which was highly political. Uh, and so uh, this, 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 this tacit alliance represented another sort of opening, if you like, uh, similar to that of the 1980s, and hence again, the expansion and uh, becoming a major civil society player. Uh, also of importance to the alliance is that movement through its educational endeavors had members uh, throughout various different apparatuses of the state because for a long time, they had been providing uh, edu high quality education in their private schools. So naturally people had found out and gotten jobs in, in a variety of these um, uh, bureaucracies. So as a result of that, when the, the, the um, Justice and Development Party came to power uh, and didn't have its own networks, the Gulen movement through this alliance provided those networks and the people with the technical know-how as they'd been doing that for, for decades. So it was a very sort of a, a symbiotic relationship in that regard. Uh, and in two, uh, 2007, uh, it's alleged uh, that the, the, the Gulen movement uh, had begun to collude with the AKP government to target uh, the military and, uh, and opened uh, what's known as the Genocon trials. And of course, this ties back to this uh, the military as being guardians of the state. Uh, and again, uh, as we saw, the, the, those coups that I mentioned, those were instigated by the military because they felt that the, the, the uh, governments were moving away from the secular values of the state as envisaged by Ataturk. So this, this uh, trial that was uh, instigated in 2007, uh, in, in allegedly between the Gulen movement and the AKP, uh, was an enormous indictment uh, with over nearly two, two, two and a half thousand pages. And it was, took place in 2008 and saw 86 charged um, with trying to overthrow uh, the state. So in the sense that they were trying to overthrow the, the Justice and Development Party. And by 2013, the various waves of the Agenicon trials were completed and 275 uh, people were convicted, including the former chief of the armed forces, Idke Bashbu. Uh, in conjunction with the Ergenicon, the GM is also alleged to have included in what's called the Balyoz trials or sledgehammer trials that started in 2010. Uh, and this was based on another alleged coup plot, uh, which resulted in 331 uh, serving members uh, and retired officers convicted. And the aim of these trials was to break the, the military tutelage uh, over the, the secular state, who, as I said, was seen as the, the guardians of the state. And perhaps uh, in hindsight, uh, given the harassment that I outlined before uh, during those three stages of development, and also uh, for the historical pushing down of Islamist parties uh, uh, through closing them, uh, there was more than 26 party closures in Turkish history. Uh, this could be seen as sort of payback uh, for the military and the role that they've played in, in, the, in the Turkish modern Turkish Republic. Now, major issue with both of these cases was that they were fundamentally flawed or they were concocted. And key pieces of evidence in both cases were called into question years before the eventual acquittals, highlighting the problematic confluence between the fact and fiction. For example, Jenkins noted in 2009, there were significant doubts dating back to 2001 regarding evidence provided by Tunjai Gune, the linchpin of the first wave of the Egenokon indictments in 2008. Uh, when examined by the uh, National Intelligence Organization, amongst others, they were generally regarded as uh, the ramblings of a uh, self-indulgent uh, narcissist or fantasist, and it was riddled with inconsistencies. Likewise, in 2011, after the indictment and supporting documentation for the Bayos case went public, 
a Harvard economics professor, Danny Roderick, uh, as part of a campaign to clear the name of his father-in-law, who happened to be General Chetan Doan, pointed out that evidence was riddled with errors. In particular, he noted that there were a host of anachronisms, namely that documents mentioned non-existent military units and referred to hospitals, NGOs, and companies with names that were only acquired later. Uh, one particularly obvious mistake that was made um, on a CD purportedly burned in 2003 was a reference to a pharmaceutical company called Yeni Recordati Ilach. Uh, and in fact, the Yeni Ilach company only took the name in 2008 when it was taken over by Italian firm Recordati. So that was uh, completely outside of the, the natural timeline. So effectively, both cases relied on what can be regarded as uh, concocted or fake evidence that was allegedly developed by the movement in collusion with the Arke pair. However, Erdogan would later claim, just prior to the Belyoz acquittal, uh, acquittals that began to take place in 2015, that he had been deceived um, in the Belyoz and again in trials by what he calls the parallel state. And uh, that was led by, uh, to, according to him, the exiled cleric for Gulen, who was living in Pennsylvania by this stage in a compound. Uh, and this is when uh, the, the, the divorce uh, had, had, had started to really take place, which I will now turn to. Uh, th there was a relationship breakdown that took place between uh, the Gulen movement and uh, the Justice and Development Party, and this really started to break down in the late uh, 2000s, so 2010. And the first cracks here emerged uh, when Gulen criticised Erdogan and his handling of the Mavi Marmara incident. Uh, so, uh, and what this was with the uh, this was uh, uh, where basically there was a Turkish-led flotilla that tried to break the Gaza blockade and deliver aid without Israel's consent. And this had resulted in Israeli commandos boarding the largest ship, the Turkish-owned Mavi Marmara, uh, and descending by ropes from helicopters whereupon clashes broke out uh, and, and nine were left dead in these clashes. In response to these events, the Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan described events as bullying and a historic mistake by Israel. In contrast, Gulen was highly critical of the affair and stated that the attempt was, and I quote, a sign of defying authority and will not lead to fruitful matters and led to what can be seen as a cautious disassociation from AK Party or the Justice and Development Party and uh, that was driven by uh, Gulen's pro-Israel stance. Uh, the rift widened further in 2012 when a prosecutor presumed uh, to be uh, part of the Gulen movement attempted to arrest Hakan Fidan, who was the chief uh, spy for the National Intelligence Agency on the grounds of treason for holding secret talks with the PKK in Oslo. The talks were allegedly sanctioned by the then Prime Minister Erdogan, and he reportedly had to intervene uh, personally to prevent the arrest of his right-hand man, his chief spymaster. Uh, following this, uh, what we saw uh, what was the beginning of a tit-for-tat retaliation that took place between the Gulen movement and the Turkish government. Uh, so uh, Erdogan hit back at the GM through initiating a law in November of 2013 that would shut down all of the Desanas, again, what I mentioned were those preparatory centers uh, that were part of the educational networks in Turkey. Uh, and these prepare students for the nationwide university entrance exams. And this was a significant move on the part of the government uh, because it operate, the, the GM operated around 40% of the uh, 3,690 Desanas in Turkey and would hit them hard financially. For example, as of 2005, the average cost uh, for a university exam, uh, a preparatory course at, at these dosanas had reached uh, 4,711 US dollars and around 2, 000, uh, 2 million students, I should say, would move through the system each year. Uh, this riposte um, saw the Gulen movement act swiftly uh, and with another investigation uh, that was allegedly opened by them. And this time it was a corruption probe against the Justice and Development Party, which took place in late December 2013, which saw four ministers resign on account of allegations of embezzlement, bribery and fraud. The investigation also brought to light uh, allegations of massive money laundering, bribery and fraud, uh, and had the potential to en entangle Erdogan and his son Bilal after the release of wiretapped conversations in which Erdogan purportedly urged Bilal to hide money uh, stashed in the home, which was kept in shoeboxes. Uh, the response to that was that the uh, agency said it was montage, it was, it was manufactured, but it caused quite a stir. And so as a result of this tit for tat that took place between the Gulen movement and the Justice and Development Party, uh, the, the, the gloves really came off on the part of the government. And so what we saw now was uh, a move into what I regard as being full hostilities. So the gloves truly came off. And in response to the corruption probe, Erdogan and his government was swift. Uh, 96 judges uh, and uh, 500, uh, sorry, judges and prosecutors and 500 police were reassigned 
And by January 2014, the number of people removed from their posts rose to several thousand. Uh, and uh, then over the next two years, the, uh, Erdogan began to actually dismantle the movement in Turkey. Uh, so we saw that the, the uh, Gulen movement TV stations were removed from satellite network in 2015. Uh, bank Asya was seized uh, in, in 2000, which was the major bank of the movement. And then Zaman newspaper was seized and eventually shut down uh, following 2000, March 2016. And also, uh, in that, uh, just um, in that uh, in early 2016, May 2016, uh, the Gulen movement was declared uh, as a terrorist organization by the government, and it was regarded as the Fatullist terror organization. Um, and again, in the midst of all of this, Erdogan uh, has claimed that the Ergenekon and the Balyoz cases were solely the work of the movement, and all of those that, that were convicted were eventually uh, acquitted in, in both 2015 and 16. So what, what the, the, the government was doing was trying to totally uh, disown itself from any of the, the, those, those undertakings uh, and place the blame squarely on the Gulen movement alone. And the, the Gulen movement was now regarded as being the parallel or the deep state uh, and was seen as a threat to the political order. Uh, following this, there was uh, a, a, a coup attempt that took place uh, in, uh, on July 15, 2016. And this really accelerated uh, the whole, the whole uh, dismantling of the Gulen movement in Turkey. Uh, Erdogan referred to the, the, the coup attempt as a gift from God. Uh, and he asserted uh, that the movement was the sole agent behind uh, the coup and that all movement members are uh, heinler, uh, traitors, and, that, and, and set about even more aggressively uh, um, deconstructing the movement. And so aided by uh, this coup attempt, which he um, placed uh, squarely on the, on, on the shoulders of Gulen and the movement, 150,000 suspected um, Gulen movement members were removed from all sectors. Um, uh, 50,000 uh, people were placed in jail and around 1,000 companies associated with the GM were seized with a total value of around 11 billion, nearly half the value of the movement was, was taken in terms of assets. Uh, the foundations for a lot of these actions, uh, so particularly the arrests, were the possession of uh, a $1 bill whose serial number started with F, uh, and these were based on claims that this somehow related to um, uh, Fatulu Gulen, uh, and the case of Serkan Golga, who is a, a physicist at NASA, is a, is a, a famous example of uh, someone who was uh, arrested whilst he was holidaying back in, 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 in Turkey at that time on account of having this so-called $1 bill. Another key ground that was uh, was having uh, the Bylock, which was like WhatsApp, which was an encrypted communication app. So those that had them were arrested as suspected, uh, what they call Gulenists. Uh, and other grounds uh, for arrest uh, were, uh, were having an account at Bank Asya, having sent your children to a GM school, uh, working at a GM institution, and I should I should stress that that many of the Gulen movement institutions uh, had many people that were actually not directly involved in the Gulen movement, uh, and this was stressed to me many times when I visited uh, organisations like Zaman during my field research there, and so on, uh, and and so th this this uh, approach or this dragnet approach uh, uh, brought a whole lot of other people and activists within to the the remit of this crackdown as well. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, the coup allowed uh, Erdogan, under the cover of blaming the Gulen movement, to attack a whole variety of different uh, sections of society, activists, civil society actors, and so forth. So naturally, many people who had no real connection to the GEM, as well as most, were also caught up. Uh, and indeed, the purges went way beyond the movement, uh, taking, also taking out leftist, leftist academics and so forth, and other perceived what were regarded as irritants to the government. Uh, so it was quite quite an extraordinary uh, development that took place as a result of that uh, coup attempt. Uh, subsequently, um, there have been um, issues uh, of abuse. Uh, the Ankara Bar Association human rights organizations, both local and international, have alleged mistreatment um, of uh, the, the, the tor and torture of suspects. Uh, in, in May of 2009, it was suspected that as many as 100 persons have been abused. And according to the Bar Association, out of, one, out, out of six detainees interviewed by them, five reported having been tortured. So there was terrible uh, treatment uh, as a result of this, this crackdown on the movement. Uh, testimonies also spoke of being blindfolded, being dragged across the floor, being hit in the head, uh, and body with a baton threatened, uh, and people also sexually assaulted uh, via baton and so forth. So there were quite some egregious um, uh, misuse of power by, by the authorities. 
Uh, and many uh, GM uh, affiliated organizations are also reporting uh, many suspicious deaths in custody. And between 2016, um, the, the, the Turkey Purge, uh, a group that was set up, subsequently reported at least 58 uh, suspicious deaths in custody. So it's quite, quite terrible. Um, and, and quite a number of those were people that had uh, medical issues and that were denied proper care. So uh, it's been quite uh, brutal. Uh, as a result of that, naturally, uh, there's been a, an incredible spike in asylum applications during that period. Uh, many members of the movements, both before and after the, the coup attempt, uh, fled and sought asylum. According to some reports, Germany was one of the main destinations with one in every two Turks seeking refuge there. Uh, between 2013-15, only around uh, 1,800 had sought asylum, but that rose to just under 6,000 6, in 2016. In 2017, uh, there were 8,483 uh, cases, and then by 2018, then we topped over 10,000 people from Turkey filed for asylum in Germany alone. Uh, around 40% of those were granted some form of protection. Another popular destination was Greece. Uh, in the wake of the, the, the failed coup attempts, 7,137 uh, uh, Turks fled to Greece seeking asylum, uh, many of them professionals. Uh, Sweden also saw an uptick and received over 250 requests for asylum from Turkey in 2015 and a further 172 following the coup uh, again. And so indeed by October 2008 it was reported there was uh, 17, uh, just over 17,000 cases pending across Europe from Turkey and the applications were mainly made in Germany, again followed by Greece, France, Sweden and Switzerland and Belgium. So there was a mass exodus of people that were fleeing uh, just leading up to the coup and beyond the coup as a result of the, the crackdown on the Gulen movement uh, and the brutality. And, and just to give some sense of the conditions that were also there is that um, given that they were called Hainle or traitors, uh, it was very difficult for anyone who was identified or suspected of being identified with the Gulen movement in that post environment, coup environment, to get work and so forth. And so they were living in very, very difficult uh, conditions. Um, subsequently, uh, this, this forcing of the Gulen movement out of Turkey um, has precipitated uh, what can be described as, as a global struggle now between the government and the Gulen movement. Uh, and so here is a statement from Yunus Akbaba, who was an advisor to uh, the former, now former Turkish Prime Minister Ben Ali Yildirim, which his position was actually made, rendered redundant in recent times. Uh, and he stated this organization somehow managed to take their members out of Turkey before and after the coup. As long as fugitive Gulen suspects remain free, Turkey cannot achieve real results in its fight against the movement. So basically, uh, the, the, just because uh, they've been quite successful in dismantling the Gulen movement in, in Turkey, this is not seen as being done. And I remember there was another quote, I think it might have been from Yildirim himself, they wanted to um, rip them out, as they said, from root and stem. So uh, basically wanting to try and eradicate them. Um, so this is, as I said, precipitated a global struggle. And as, as, as many people have gone into exile, uh, there's now pushback uh, from the Gulen movement side. Uh, and amongst those that have sought exile in Sweden, uh, for example, is a high profile uh, former bureau chief of today's imam, Abdullah Bozkurt, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, the, and I should say today's imam was now the defunct English daily of having been shut down. Uh, and he's the director now of the Stockholm Center for Freedom, which was founded following uh, the, the coup attempt. Uh, and the, the center is a not-for-profit advocacy organization that began um, with a team of 10 volunteers that document violations of the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights with special focus on Turkey. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are now other, there are other like organizations which were established um, in and around this time. Similarly, for example, in the UK, there's another setup uh, with another former journalist uh, in Karen Balju, who was a columnist for the Zaman and Today's um, and and uh, this is the uh, Turkey Institute in the UK, uh, and the Turkey's Institute remit is uh, rely uh, is to is to also report on um, these these human rights abuses, and more recently in Australia, there was also Advocates for Dignity was set up uh, in Australia. So basically, the, these these advocacy groups, these human rights groups, have now been set up by the Gulen movement uh, to push back. Um, and it's most likely these sorts of organizations and these groups which are using now the movement's extensive international networks um, uh, as, as a means of uh, functioning in exile. Uh, as I said before, during the, the, the boom period in the 2000s, um, after having moved into Central Asia, they expanded to around 160 countries, which means they have nodes in many, many places, such as um, uh, Sweden and, uh, and the UK, 
and have been able to use that sort of, I guess, that, that network and social capital to establish these organizations and be able to push back uh, against the treatment from uh, the, the uh, Justice and Development Party and Erdogan. Um, and as part of this struggle, as well, uh, the, 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 the being, being a, now a transnational uh, fight between the Gulen movement and the Justice and Development Party, uh, Turkish embassies and consulates have been putting pressure on foreign governments to hand over GM uh, members and curb their, curb their activities. Uh, and there have also been um, extraordinary renditions uh, to, uh, of GM members uh, from Malaysia and Kosovo. And more recently in 21, there was also um, uh, one of Gulen's nephews was, was um, rendered from uh, Kenya. Uh, and movement schools in, in run in some countries have uh, been taken over by the Turkish state through the Maref Foundation, the, the state's education foundation. Uh, and, and just to give a sense of some of the pressure that the, the movement has, has been put in uh, is actually during my, my time at Deakin, um, there was a chair that was set up by, by the movement uh, uh, called the, uh, for Intercul uh, Islamic Studies and Intercultural Dialogue. Uh, and as part of the welcoming of the inaugural chair, um, a statement was read out by a, a senior member of the movement uh, in a, a speech written by uh, Gulen for the occasion. Uh, and as part of the address, uh, Gulen commended uh, Deakin University for going ahead with the launch and the appointment, despite pressure from what, they, what was called unnamed third parties uh, to back out of the arrangement. And so the statement said, uh, the university's decision to establish this chair is significant. It is a statement of commitment by Deakin University to freedom of thought and expression. I was informed that the university faced pressures to back away from the establishment of this chair by third parties out of political concerns by going forward with their decision and leadership of uh, Deakin University reminded their counterparts that universities are places of research and learning and every subject can be studied within the guidelines of scientific inquiry and trying to suppress freedom of thought and expression is both unethical and futile. Now, whilst it's obviously not made clear in that particular statement if that, uh, what the nature of the pressure was, it's fair to assume that the request came from probably the Turkish consulate um, with such tactics reportedly also employed in Kenya and Germany amongst others. Uh, in the latter, the Premier of the Southwestern State, Baden-Württemberg, um, uh, Winifred uh, Kretschmann, is said to have received a letter from the Turkish Consul General asking him to review a list of institutions that recruited private schools. So there's, there's some evidence to suggest that they were very active on the part of, of uh, embassies and consulates trying to put pressure on, uh, on these uh, institutions to sort of shun the Gulen movement. Uh, and as I mentioned, there were also these renditions. Uh, six members were taken from Kosovo, uh, in, in just as one example. And it's, it's said, Freedom House has claimed that it's actually this has taken place now in 31 uh, separate countries. So again, the the, the, the uh, Turkish government is is quite aggressively pursuing the movement abroad uh, and using extraordinary measures as well. Uh, and as and and some, uh, as I said, uh, some countries, particularly Somalia, has actually handed over its schools due to pressure, due to significant investment in construction in that country to the, the state-run Mara Foundation. So they're also now also trying to acquire assets overseas from the Gulen movement as well. So that's the present state of place. So coming to the future, what's most likely, I think um, that, that, that um, as, as a result of the movement having been largely crippled in Turkey through these purges and asset sieges, uh, it's, it's, it's likely they're going to have to continue to function in, in, in exile. As I mentioned, that the, as a result of the educational work that they've been doing, uh, setting up schools across uh, the globe, for example, in the US, they have some uh, 130 plus charter schools. Even in Australia, they have around 13 schools uh, from, from memory. So they have very good networks and, uh, and organizations uh, and institutional support within many different countries, particularly in the West. And so they'll be able to continue to push back against this assault from the Turkish government. Um, and I think that it's, it's probably unlikely um, that they're going to be able to return to Turkey anytime soon unless there's significant changes. And so they will most likely continue to operate in exile and function now as something of a resistance movement to the Turkish uh, government. And this is partly because uh, there is a lack of sympathy uh, for the gym in, in, in secular circles. Indeed, there was never much love loss uh, uh, to begin with, uh, on, on account of the persecution from secular forces during their formative period and subsequent stages of development. And of course, the persecution of the military by the movement through Agenekon and Balyoz. Uh, further, um, there is uh, no sympathy from the supporters of AKP, which constitutes around 40% of the population. 
uh, going by current electoral support. So if we estimate the, the secular forces around 35% and you take in allies now with the alliances, we're looking at somewhere in vicinity of 80% or more of the Turkish society um, being less than sympathetic towards the movement. Therefore, it seems unlikely that the movement be able to rehabilitate itself uh, anytime uh, uh, soon. And as I said, that the movement will um, continue as a result to uh, uh, stay in, in, um, in, in exile. And I could, as I mentioned, I didn't spot there that the, the 64.4% of the, of the um, following the coup believe that the, the, the movement was behind the coup. Uh, so again, th there was a lot, no, not a lot of sympathy and support there either. Uh, and that, th thank you so much. That concludes uh, my talk. Uh, and just for those who are interested um, in the last slide, there's a list of sources for anyone who's um, interested in doing some further reading about the movement uh, and their, their, their activities and, and the current predicament. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for that, David. We'll just leave this, this image up on the screen for a few seconds before we end the recording. But thank you. Thank you very much for that.